Hello there, Chris here from Becker's Models, and I think I've got the kit of the year, 2023, the best kit so far that's come out. I think this is it. This is going to be an extensive review done in two parts, okay? You're watching part one, and in part one, I'm going to go over what's in the box. What do you get? What do the instructions entail? The decals, what do they look like? And then a very big sprue tour, looking at all those parts. In part two, I'm actually going to show you how to build it okay this is a full dry fit build of the uh, airframe itself and the cockpit that's all just dry fit together a little bit of tape so what I'll be doing in part two is I'll be showing you how this goes together and I'm going to compare it to some of the other parts that are uh, other kits that are out there like the uh, 148 scale Tamiya Mark 1 and the 132 scale Tamiya late Merlin kit so get a comparable sort of idea of what is what do you really get for your money okay so Let's get straight into it. It's going to be a long one. Remember to click forward and back on the um, sliding bar there on your YouTube player so you can, um, you know, go forward to the sections you actually want to watch or you want to rewatch. And uh, yeah, let's go. Let's start with what the box contains. Okay, so first of all, if you're a fan of the now defunct Wingnut Wings, you'll notice a very interesting, um, hmm. Looks a lot like Wingnut Wings layout, doesn't it? With the profiles, with the artwork, with the warnings and the, the labels and so forth. Well, yeah, you can understand that there is a lot of Wingnut Wings heritage people working now in Kotari. So um, there they are. So it starts with this amazing artwork from Daryl Legg. And he's a, he's a magnificent artist. If, if I had any other hobby, it would be trying to, to do this myself, you know, in, in flight, of course, which is how all Spitfires should be posed, in my opinion. So Daryl Legg um, is an amazing aviation artist and you actually get a print of this without the labels and everything in the box. Isn't that fantastic? You can frame it up, put it on your wall. I'm definitely doing that. I've got aviation art all around my office here and I'm definitely going to have a space for that. Now on the sides we get the little blurb about the, um, the Spitfire itself and its role in, the, in um, Battle of Britain and the particular marks they're doing in this one. And then we get these fantastic three profiles because you can do out of the box one of these three uh, Mark 1A mid uh, Spitfires from Ronnie Barr and Ronnie Barr does fantastic profile work uh, very accurate very evocative great stuff and that's you, when you when I show you the instructions which are a kit in of themselves the kit the instructions are amazing they are just the top quality you cannot get any better instructions so let's go around yeah plastic part cans only 117 it's actually this kit will fly together very quickly pardon the pun okay we got some uh, whatever's there, some, you know, language things, barcodes, blah, blah, blah. Designed in New Zealand, manufactured in China. Right, so what do we get in the box? Let's open it up. So what we get first is a lovely message from the man who has actually started Kotari Models. And uh, yeah, it's just fantastic. Mark Robson, he's, he's got a two-page blurb here on how he started the, the new company and how he brought on Richard Alexander from Wingnut Wings and you know who helped him invest in the company and how it's got started and i love this this is a real personal touch you know compared to say i mean I, i've had a, a crap time trying to deal with border models for example you know an anonymous people thousands of kilometers away not really giving you the time of day they couldn't give two shits about you right whereas these people here they're literally across the ditch i can email them i can get on the phone i can have a chat to them and i know where their heart is i know where their passion is and oh my god they are passionate about this that's why I'm trying to give them as much a leg up as anyone. I mean, I'm no one, but I'm trying to give them as much leg up as I can. Uh, here's the instruction book, and it's a book. We'll have a quick, we'll have a deep look, sorry, into that later. It's nearly 30 pages, lots of photos, lots of illustrations, lots of, hey, here's some references exactly of the model you're making of that exact aircraft. Wow, you know. And also one thing, one of the, one of the builders in... Um, the model group has, has said, like, for example, if you can point that out here, instead of just saying, oh, it's part D6, it actually tells you what it is. A Dunlop AH2174 spade grip and brake lever, you know. So it goes back to the old days. If you've built the old Tamiya kits, military kits from the 1980s and 70s, they actually told you what the part was. And same the old Matchbox, some of the old Revell kits, they did the same thing. They told you, hey, this was the control stick. This was the elevator. This was that. Instead of just... A lot of stuff nowadays, it's just a CAD drawing that's just that's just cut and paste into an instruction booklet with part numbers and half the time the part numbers aren't bloody right. So we get a box that's not quite full of plastic. We get a clear sprue, which 
as much as it's in one plastic thing, it would be nice for this to be in a small um, cardboard case. It wouldn't. It would increase the cost a little bit, but it would also make um, the chance of these being broken completely eliminated. And it's something I think they should think about in future. Uh, we get this sprue. We get the main wing sprue, so you can get a good idea of the size, 30 centimeter odd size. We get some 3D printed parts, which some of the, um, if you pre-ordered this kit, you get 3D printed one piece exhaust stack, so that's great. And then we get only two more sprues after that. We've got the main fuselage halves. Sorry about the glare, but I'd like to keep the light up. Well, I'll take these all out, okay? And then we get the ancillary sprue with wheels, and another prop, there's actually two props in the kit, wheel covers and so forth. And right on the bottom, is a full-size decal sheet. No, it's not a Wingnut Wings kit. I'm just showing you the comparison between what the Kotari instructions look like compared to the old Wingnut Wings. And they're using same font, almost the same layout, same sort of tables of information, um, same sort of sprue layout and so forth. So, and same idea with the, the paint callouts and everything. So just to give you an idea, if you're familiar with Wingnut Wing kits, this is the sort of quality that you're getting. This is my AEG uh, G4, which I've just got gifted. Thank you very much. Okay, so the instructions. What do we get? We get a bloody big book. Excuse my French. Uh, 27 pages to the to the back. And let's go through it. I'm going to go through it very carefully. Uh, I'm sorry this is going to take longer than usual. But like I said, you can always click forward in the, uh, the things below. So, front page, we get something that, oh my god, I wish all instructions would have this. And this is we're, we're modelers, we're real passionate about the subject. We want to build a piece of history. We want to have that, you know, on the shelf or flying in the air in our office or on our on our desk or wherever. We want to know about the subject. And here we go. We've got, you know, seven odd paragraphs of full dense information about the background behind how the Spitfire was developed, why this is describing the early model, the Mark I, the, uh, then the Mark A, some variants using, for example, the 20 millimeter cannons, and then talking specifically about the, um, hopefully I should zoom in there so you can see that, uh, about the, the different colors that we use at different points in time leading up to the Battle of Britain, because you gotta remember there was uh, Dunkirk, the Battle of France, there's um, the Phony War, etc., etc., leading up to uh, summer 1940, and then, yeah, and then we've got a basic table of weights and measures and so forth. So we get, a, we get a fantastic start of putting it everything into context of what you're actually building. Turn the page, you get the usual very small um, warning signs here basically to say, you know, don't eat the glue, don't sniff anything, etc, etc. Uh, and then a generic table there of what to do, what not to do, how to apply, uh, you know, where, where decals are to be applied. What do you call these things? A legend. There we go. A legend. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then we get a three part uh, paint call out. Let's zoom in because you can't see what I'm talking about. Is that better? Okay. So we get quite a comprehensive color list here with three types. We've got Tamiya, Humbrol, and the FS or BS. So FS is federal standard, BS is British standard. And if you use some of the um, very, very available, sometimes free uh, color matching apps. So if you want to say, you know, you want to do uh, dark green pale, that's 34079 pipe that into your app, gives you all the all the ones for, you know, Gunze, for um, Mr. Hobby, Mr. Mr. Hobby, Mr. Color, uh, MRP, SMS, all those different types. So they've, they've done the sort of what they did with Wingnut Wings, which was rely mainly on Tamiya, but they've given you some mixes uh, and then some other ones, if you like, into your brush painting or spraying Humbrol there. So that's really good. So the only thing I would say to improve that would be what Great Wall Hobby does in this actual first the cover page is actually separate to the entire instruction booklet, so you can have that separate. But it's a very, very minor point. They'll stick with this because this is what they're familiar with with wingnut wings. Then we got, get what's called a sprue map, and that's where you get to see, okay, where are the parts on the sprue, including the decals. So we've got A, B, C, D, and E here. Okay, and they do say a few parts aren't used. Now, I'll just say up front, I'm an enthusiast of the Spitfire. I'm not an expert. I will get things wrong. There are much more learned people out there who understand this aircraft and know its ins and outs, not only at Kotari, but on, you know, where there's seasoned modelers out there. I've only been modeling for a handful of years. So if I get things wrong, I apologize in advance. But like I said, I'm an enthusiast. So let's start. The, 
plane begins with construction of the co cockpit. Ha <laughs> ha. Now, one thing that has been highlighted, some people are a bit up in the air about the way that they've done the instrument panel. The way they've done it, as you can see by this plethora of callouts, is individual decals, individual decals for each of the dials. And the dials aren't raised, the bezels are. Okay, so the bezel itself around where the, the instruments are, but not the individual instruments. So, yes, it's tedious, but yes, you get a very faithful um, representation. I'll see if I can put a photo up of one that's been constructed already using this technique. So some people don't like it, some people really like it. And again, it's one of those things you can either go for it out of the box, or I'm sure Yahoo and Edward and all those other guys are going to come out with a one piece, just plonk it in, you don't even do any painting. Um, so there we are. Okay, so we've got this fantastic way of illustrating where the parts go. So you have the highlighted blue bits are the new bits that are going to be put onto a previous bit, and each one is called out with an individual or sometimes a double paint call out. So look, you know, if I can put this together, you can put it together. It's not that hard. This is Tamiya Wingnut Wings level quality of construction uh, and the way it's all been thought out. So we've got the control, control sticks, elevator controls and so forth going on. We've got the pilot seat here and we've got armor plate options as well. And there's the seat assembly going into the uh, cockpit. Now, the lightning holes that are around the frames have not been drilled out. So I would get your um, Dremel or Proxon tool. Where are you, Mr. Proxon? There we are, Mr. Proxon. Do, do, do. You know, 10 minute job to drill them out and clean them up nicely. And let's move on. Cockpit continued, more drilling out, uh, more frames put in. So we're getting quite a few frames here. We're getting uh, the, you know, the main cockpit, the pilot seat, and then you get the two behind uh, with a lot more detail. And they also give you a full rigging diagram. So if you want to rig, all the controls have at it <laughs> and now we get actually a full color call out of what it will look like painted up not everything but almost everything here uh, to explain you know what it's going to look like when it's finished and same with the side details so i mean this is amazing is it amazing well no it's just high quality you don't get this with all models if you're new to this game not all models are like this so be grateful for what you get so here's the side pieces going in and you get basically a full tub. The Tamiya Mark 1 in 148 does a very similar thing. And we get some references inside as we go. Shall I continue? Yes, I shall. Uh, now we do the fuselage interior. So now we're putting the two fuselage pieces together. And this is where you start to see, if I can talk over those bloody rainbow lorikeets outside, you can see the genius of what they've done at Kotari here. They have not included a Merlin engine. Again, a part that some people are like, oh, yeah, they should have included the engine. It's not fair. They should be in there. Okay, yeah, if you want to do a wheels down display and you want to have someone working on it, I can understand that. Again, aftermarket will apply. And again, I am sure if they're smart, Kotari will make an engine kit set by itself, like they did with Wingnut Wings, where they had, you could actually buy the sprues for the different engines for all the different World War One aircraft, which makes sense. Okay, so they can invest time and energy into making all the different marks of the, um, the Merlin engine. But what they've done here, of course, is you sandwich the cockpit halves, the cockpit tub into the fuselage halves, and notice there's a gap there. There's a big gap there. Why? Because they've eliminated all of the seams on this top edge. Wow. So all you have to do is glue them together and then put these other pieces on over the top and you're pretty much done. There's almost no seam cleanup, which is amazing. So you've got um, quite a few extra parts there going on. I'm going to skip forward and there's where we put on the spine. Now there have been a few people having problems with this and that is all related to the fact that you should not paint on any of the mating surfaces, just like wing nut wings. And I remember that when I built my first wing nut wing kit, the Albatross. You cannot paint on any of the bearers or any of the surfaces that are going to have glue touching together. Just don't even think about it. Or if you do paint on them, lightly sand over them. That's how tight these tolerances are. You cannot get away with it. And, and there has been someone on the large scale plane forum. He had a problem trying to put this spine in and then he worked out, oh, I just got to sand away the paint and clicks in. And anyway, this particular joint here is a lapping joint. It's not going to be a, a butt joint. It's actually going to be lapped slightly over like that over my index fingers as I show there. So we do that, we put the top cowling, plinks in, 
we put the empennage together with the tail plane okay they've got them in the down position but i'm sure you can modify them to go up or down which is what i'll do for mine because mine's going to be yep in flight then we put the guns in now they've done basically just done little inserts here with the brownings okay and we put the wheel well uh the wheel well details inside these these wings now i'll show you later the wings are really interesting they've got multitude of ribs look at it all there okay and it actually looks like somewhat like stressed skin somewhat like i haven't seen it yet done in on paint to look that way but that's something to look at shortly let's move to the wings with the famous elliptical wing uh, and the, the upper halves go on the top there they give you some detail here to show you what the ailerons actually look like with the um the fabric stitching and then what we've got here are fillets okay so instead of putting these pieces on the fuselage you actually attach them to the wing and then it's slotted in if we go over here we'll skip got some radiator detail and the oil cooler detail which uh, is actually better than say for example the tamiya spitfires they uh, they emit a bit of detail in theirs uh, so that's where the fuselage just clocks in there and then you've got the oil tank and bottom cowlings of the engine again because there's actually no engine parts there there's no problem there trying to align everything another potential fault with the tamiya spitfires you've got to get it just right okay we move on to the undercarriage and this looks extremely well even over engineered and this is where my focus is going to be i'll speak about this in a separate video but i'm actually going to design and 3d print my own uh, in-flight versions of these parts but uh, so far everyone has said this has been you know a locked in fantastic way to represent the wheels down and there's a lot of detail in there uh, moving ahead we've got more details to finish off the aircraft we've got the exhaust exhaust stack so the plastic parts are two part whereas the 3d parts are one you just slot them in they do advise you to cut them out uh, to drill drill out some more detail there's two types of propellers included you've got the de havilland and then you've got the, the rotol so that's good and the rudder goes on and we're almost there we've got the canopy they do include two canopies so we've got a complete one piece so fully closed or you can have a separate windscreen and a sliding uh, hood and the hood does fit perfectly uh, in the open position just even tacked in there without any glue and then there's just a very small piece of rigging to go ahead for some for b and c not the a version then we move on to the stencil so you get a full page it's a full a4 page of where to put all the stencils including some warnings about where not to put them and then we move into the profiles so the first one is the box art which is uh alan deer's um klb particular aircraft here n3180 with actual photographs oh, put it in screen chris <laughs> of the actual aircraft what it looks like and also the burnt out remains of it when it when it crashed uh plus all the specific call outs there done by ronnie barr absolutely fantastic I am really tempted to do that one because I really love the white and black contrast there because I want to pose mine in flight on a very steep banking um, climb. Then we get the um, the Dirty Dick. I hope you can still say that on tele on YouTube. Okay, um, N3277. Again, a full two pages dedicated to that one profile with you know five photos of the actual aircraft or six photos. Of the aircraft and then the final one is a famous one dwk with his massive um uh call insignias there uh you know flown by douglas corf uh and jay ellis p litchfield very famous uh, 610 squadron uh, aircraft there's some really really great photos of this particular aircraft in flight and on the ground if you really want to do it that way uh very that this one got really dirty from memory so again two pages and then we get some more just generic reference photos so you can see the how the stencils show some different coloring and so forth this is a um, one that's just been literally built and delivered uh, another one there okay and some more on the ground details and even more at the back there and even more i mean yeah and then we get a lovely six part uh, explanation of the people behind the actual behind the model company which i love i actually love that it personalizes everything and to me that's what you should support. You should support people who put their heart and soul into what this is. And that's, this should be a great business. So that's the instructions all done. Let's look at the parts. 
Let's have a quick look at the uh, decals, and I've just finished watching Jan, uh, Genesis Models, her review of this fantastic kit, and she rightly pointed out with the decal she that if you look at the glare there, there's hardly any carrier film, and these must be extremely thin, and oh my god, I've almost cut that one off opening the bag, so hopefully that's not too bad. Um, but yeah, they look they look amazing. There have been some questions, and a very rude question, the way the man asked it, I thought, uh, of these color codes. They look a little bit too blue, but they may actually... Um, it may do with uh, color crush, tone crush, when you put them next to over, over the actual camouflage. I'm not too sure about that. I personally would actually... Um, mask these and spray them also with all the the major ones but then having said that if you look closely some of these uh, randalls also have some of the stencils already embedded in them so look at those wing ones there okay they've got the ones for the some of the gun panels so yeah these, this steckle sheet is quite quite good notice that the gun cover uh, and for the uh, these open ones here are not perfectly straight so you get that sort of roughness of how they applied the tape over the um, the muzzles there, so that's fantastic. And then, oh, upside down, Miss Jane. We've got the individual dials for the um, the cockpit there, and they're nice and small, nice and easily, nice, light, nicely numbered, nice, 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 all the way through, and everything else like that. God, I hate that. <laughs> so the stencils look fantastic. Everything is in English or close enough to English, Kiwi English. Um, yeah, just amazing decal sheet. So the only concern I have is that perhaps these are a little bit too blue, but maybe they'll dull down a little bit with a, like I said, with the tonal crush you might get with the underlying colours. So onwards and upwards, let's look at the sprues. The sprue tour starts with sprue A. And as you can see, there's already some markings there for a mark one, a mark two, and a mark five. Interesting. <laughs> So it looks like Kotari are going to be releasing uh, additional variants of the Spitfire and in fact there's more hints as we go on in the sprue. So what I want to highlight in this one is we've got some cockpit frames here and as you can see apart from some of the major holes the other ones need to be drilled out. Very very simple to do. You don't necessarily have to go all the way down to the bottom because you're never going to see them but of course the ones at the top, top here and here need doing. Uh, the detail here is very crisp, it's lovely. The What I look for when I do a sprue tour is not just, I'm not just looking at, hey, there's lots of parts and all oh, whiz bang, oh, that looks fantastic. You need to be looking at where are the attachments, okay? Are they on the edge of a bloody blade? Sometimes you see that. No, they're in, in the hub there, okay? They're not too chunky, they're quite petite. Some of these are a little bit big, but uh, easy to get through with your sprue cutters. So what you want to see is well thought out, and if I'll just turn this over, well thought out positions for where the actual plastic is going to hit the um, uh, the running gates where the plastic is injected in. On these um, wheels, for example, they're all moulded with flat edges. You've got this style of overcut there, so that's really easy to um, to get a nice sharp edge. I can't see any uh, ejection pin marks that are a, are a problem place. Like for example, these two-part exhaust stacks, the ejection pin marks are on the inside, which will never be seen. Uh, when we talk about things like cockpit doors here no ejection pin marks there and then i'll just flip that over again uh, oh there are some ejection pin marks on this one but ah that's the open version okay so that's the open version that's the closed one so you'll never see the, those two ejection pin marks because they'll be up alongside the fuselage like that whereas this is the closed version and again we flip over again completely smooth and lovely so a nice start as we go Let's go to the next sprue. Sprue B. More clues that we're going to get different variants. There's a Mark II there as well. Okay, so this is the major cockpit part. So we've got the sidewall details there. We've got some seats. There are two versions of seats. Thank dog below. They've thought this through. They've molded the harnesses on one. Now, I must admit that doesn't look that authentic and that good looking, but, you know, it's good enough for... For most purposes, you may want to um, not install this one and install the bare one and then get some nice fabric harnesses. So that's an idea. Uh, I'll obviously use that one because I want to have a pilot on mine. We've got the tail wheel here. Again, it's nice and it's flattened out, which is a shame because, again, I'm going to have mine in flight. So that one needs to be built up a bit. The seat parts, the seat sides are very, very well detailed. Petite rivet detail there. The handles all look fantastic. 
and then we get to the instrument panel so I'll just zoom in a little bit there so we've got a combination of recess styles raised um, indicator switches we've got the compass oh the compass has been molded inside there so on the Tamiya one you have to actually include this and it's a pain it's a little photo etch part and a decal you put in there but they've actually put that in there they've left room here for the cables that go to the back so you can uh, rig them in yourself uh, some of these external ejection pin marks are quite big but they actually taper off to a very small part there so very easy to clean off lovely so we've got I think that is that the throttle lever or the undercarriage lever there I can't remember where, what part that is again excuse my ignorance sometimes I forget but that's very nicely done we've got the rudder pedals here molded as separate pieces and here's one of the um, I think that's the is that the rotol prop I can't remember I have to look at the instructions now there is one part here that I have been told has a well we won't call it a fault it's just it's just an indication of the slide molding used. There is a mold seam on this upper engine panel that runs all the way along here. Okay, and I'm just going to carefully, it's it's raised along this edge and along here it's slightly indented so I would scrape that off using, I've got an SMS ceramic scraper that should get rid of most of it and some very careful sanding there and maybe a small amount of filler to get and just be careful you don't remove there's a single Zeus fastener there don't remove that so that's I do remember John Colasanto he mentioned that on his review so that's one to watch out for there so let's move on to the next sprue so it's sprue D and now we've got an even more uh, let's see if you can see that sorry okay so it's mark 1A 2A VA 5A why is that an AAA because this is an A wing the A wing has the eight Browning 303 guns four on each side spitfires came in different marks they had um, the b wing the c wing the e wing no not x wings um, so that's really good so katari have molded this whole sprue for all the a types so the 2a which will which is the post battle of britain version and the mark 5a not the mark 5b which had the cannons so looking here let's have a look one of the uh, things that people have I think illegitimately criticised Kotari for is the lack of rivet detail. Now, if you look at any trumpeter kit, you know, Mr. Mad Riveter, I don't know what they're drinking over there, sake or, or um, I don't know, rice wine or something, they go nuts with the rivets. They put rivets everywhere, even rivets where they're not even supposed to bloody be. Okay, the reality is, like the Mustang later on, the P51, the, uh, the leading edge of the wing was all smoothed over. All the rivets were eliminated, they were flush riveted to start with, and then they smoothed them over. And that's what Katari have done. They're giving you what the actual subject looked like, not what you think it looked like. If you want to add rivets, go for it. And you may want to add, you know, some additional rivets here because it comes up really nicely when you've got some heavy weathering. But there's obvious fasteners on all the gun bays, which makes sense but they haven't added them where you don't need them. Now, converse to that Tamiya, their P51, which is the best P51 kit on the market, festooned with rivets, which were all <laughs> filled. So you have to go to the point of, you know, using a lot of filler on a very expensive kit to get it looking just right. And then it looks toy-like because it's filled. So yeah, you can't please everyone, can you? So there are some fantastic details here. I've lost my pointy sticky thing. Pointy sticky thing is back. Fantastic details here on the underside. Um, we've got some good detail there for one of the radiators, including raised rivets there on the on the inside. Fantastic scoops, all the access covers. Looks great, great, grand, fantastic. Ah, look at that. We even get the control stick here, and that is extremely tight detail. I mean, even with my bad glasses that I've got on. I can see quite a lot of detail there and on that stick as well. Ailerons. Now, the ailerons have some large um, notches here, which is great, which means I'm just going to flip this over. Yes, so there's going to be some room there so I can actually pose them. Now, if you if you do look, some, some parked Spitfires have the aileron, ailerons. Most of them have them flush, but a lot of them have them opposed. So you'll see, you know, because they've when they've parked, they put the, the stick in, they've moved the stick left or right, the control stick, and of course if that happens, the ailerons will go, will deflect or oppose each other. So, and then for in-flight, of course, I want to have them, they'll have a small deflection when they're, when they're banking and turning. The fabric detail looks fantastic. I can't see any problems with it. Is that a mold seam? No, it's a run, it's a cool coolness when the plastic goes in and cools. So that's sprue D. I'm looking at the rivets as well. Sorry, I haven't looked at the rivets. Rivets, uh, rivets. 
fillets, <laughs> rivets on the fillets, so that three times fast. Very, very nice, very crisp. You've got some very small sprue attachment points. That's, that's high quality, we've got some high quality molding here. We're almost at the end, talking off camera, excuse my French. We've got sprue E, and again we go down to the nomenclature that they're using here is just a generic mark one, two, and five, or V, and that's a fuselage halves. Now you'll notice that there's something missing, and someone had a big, bitchy, whiny, Meh, meh, meh. There's no engine included in the kit. Yeah, there's no engine. There's no Merlin engine included in the kit. So, um, not all aircraft have to be parked with every single frickin', and I mean the F word, gun bay, engine bay, doors open. It's not a car. It's an aircraft. Okay? The most beautiful thing in the world for some people is a Spitfire Mark I. And flying or on the ground, you don't need to see the engine. Okay? Yes, a lot of the other 132 scale aircraft models have engines in them. You know, the Trumpeter Mark V has one, the, and it's woeful. The Ravel has one, and it, I think, does it? I can't remember. That's a very forgettable kit, that Ravel Mark II. Uh, and of course, all the Tamiya Spits have them. But you get to the problem of, you know, who's, <laughs> do you really need it? If you really need it, well, guess what? I reckon going to what they they did with Wingnut Wings, Kotari, if they're smart, will actually have a Merlin engine ready to go as a separate kit set. So you could buy one, say, if you know, 20 bucks, bang, or 10 bucks, or I don't know how much it's going to cost. Who cares? I mean, they made all different of those Merlin engines for their Lancaster for Wingnut Wings. I'm sure that they can develop one, and I'm sure that there's an easy way to, to plonk one in there. But for 95% of the people who are going to build this, they're going to build it out of the box, you're going to build it, and the way it's engineered is there's no seam clean up on the top side. You only got one single seam to clean up here. That's it, because the cowlings fit into this big, nice, chunky position with some keyed, keyed posts there. See so that big, big post there for this underside? Oop, not in camera, Chris. For this underside cowling here. Okay, it was beautiful one-piece cowling. Look at that. Clonk goes straight in there like that. You've got the fuel tank over the top, which has lapped panels. A lot of kits don't do that, they want to make it perfect, and it's like, no, these weren't perfectly made, they had lapped panels. And then you've got the side cowling pieces, which just snap on. Now, if anybody out there has built, and I've built a couple, the 132 Tamiya, the late Merlin versions, the uh, 8, 9, and 16, the fit of the engine can be problematic if you don't get it exactly right. So, you know, middle finger to those people say anybody can build a Tamiya kit, well, no, you can't, because they're com very complex at the 132 scale size because they put so much effort into engineering a near perfect Merlin engine with razor thin a cowling because that's you have to do it by scale or otherwise the engine is, is under scale whereas these are obviously over scale they're too thick but it doesn't matter because they're closed up so can you see my point I can understand why Kotari have done it I can also understand why there's people out there who are not happy with having a Merlin engine there I could be a real bastard and say, well, maybe you should try car modeling instead. Or I could say, okay, I understand your frustrations and maybe you could, you know, wait for Edward. I'm positive Edward are going to bring one out in 132. You could wait for Kotari to do it. Or you could just enjoy the kit as it is, you know. Uh, just know that it, it's not there. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got a one-piece elevators and they've been engineered to be deflected down. Uh, we've got the, and the detail on those are lovely, especially on the trim tabs as well. We've got the spine here, and I'm going to bring it a bit closer. Uh, it's all raised rivet detail. Now, you wonder why have they done this? Why have they want, made this a one-piece spine? Well, the devil is literally in the detail. There's a double row of raised rivets there. If this was two halves, like you normally see with most models, aircraft models of single-engine prop fighters, that would be split. You'd put them together, you would try to fill the seam, and you would eliminate all that lovely detail. Uh, yeah, so Katari, hats off. You've done a great job there. We've got a large wing spar here that goes the, to bring everything in. And we've got the, the fuselage floor. It's actually not the cockpit floor uh, of the cockpit there. And it's just fantastic detail, all those raised details there. I mean, yeah, this, this is looking superb. It's, it's looking extremely well detailed. Now, last sprue, I believe, is, is C. C for clear. And we've got Mark 1 and Mark 2 noted there. We've got the two options. We've got the one complete piece. I'll get my fat sausage figures out of the way. Sorry about that. One complete piece uh, canopy windscreen, or you've got a separate windscreen. And notice that it's armoured, okay? Unlike the earlier Mark 1s. Uh, and the, the hood. 
and the um, and the other piece, the the rear piece there. And then we've got gun flight uh, reflectors and some other lights. There's a gun gun sight and other the landing lights and so forth. Now there is a problem with this, and I have been able to buff it out a little bit. There were some minor scratches on the top of that one and that one, and I will give it another buff. I literally just used my T-shirt here off camera, and that's one of the things I reckon they should put this in a little box. Uh, what have we got left? We've got one more thing, haven't we? Yes. And that are these lovely 3D printed parts that you get with a pre-order. So these are the single piece exhaust stacks, already been pre-drilled. You can't see that last one there, I'll just do it there. So there you go, see it's been pre-drilled, that last one. Okay, just snap that off. So this is 3D printed resin. Um, let's have a look at the layer lines, which is the first thing you want to look at. And I can't see any with my naked eye. There's not much of a texture at all. It's very smooth. So these are quite high quality parts. Got some lovely rivet detail there, or fastener detail, I should say, on the individual stacks where they go in. Yeah, so that's going to be a great addition. So if they, uh, somebody else is making these, I think Ask or Edward, I can't remember the company. Um, I'm sure you can tell me in the comments. I mean, look how thin that, that is. You can't replicate that with a, with a drill unless you're um, really, really skilled, which I'm not. So that's fantastic. That's going to... So that's part one of the review over. I apologize for it being so long, but I really wanted to make it as comprehensive as possible. Here's the print. I've already got it in one of my cheapish <laughs> frames here that's going to go on my wall. So remember, part two, we're going to go over um, how this thing goes together. The actual full build of the kit. Okay. What are the... Um, what are the things to look out for? How does it compare to other kits? So I want you to stick around for part two, and then you can get an idea of, you know, why you should get this kit. I actually do think that this is the kit of 2023, at least for me it is. So until part two, I'll catch you later.